section twenty of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter ten history of france thirteen eighty to fourteen fifty three part two henry's enemies could now be looked on as rebels and the two years of his regency were still years of fighting for the suppression of rebellion in fourteen twenty two worn out by his exertions he died at vincennes when only thirty-five and was mourned by french as well as english for his rule though severe was just and orderly pierre de fenin writes of the grief felt at his death for he was a prince of much understanding who had great regard for justice so that the poor loved him above all others moreover he was determined to protect the lower classes against the insupportable violence and extortions of the nobles which won him the favour and prayers of the clergy as well as of the poor people two months later in october of fourteen twenty two the poor mad king of france at last ended his long and miserable reign he was much lamented by his subjects who had always kept a warm place in their hearts for the unfortunate monarch and firmly believed that he would have done great things had he only been given a mind more robust the nobles paid no reverence to his corpse which was accompanied to the tomb by henry's brother the duke of bedford and his english followers but the parisians wept as the funeral procession passed through their streets each cried as though at the death of their best beloved ah dear prince never shall we see you again never shall we have one so good as the king's body was placed in its resting-place at st denis the herald proclaimed god give good life to king henry by the grace of god king of france and england our sovereign lord but the people murmured when they saw the sword of the french kings borne before bedford as regent for the infant english monarch there were now two kings in france the english held paris for henry the sixth a child of ten months old who was also recognized in picardy normandy champagne guienne gascony and the burgundian territories charles the seventh at bourges had the support of touraine dauphine berry and poitou brittany was doubtful but eventually lent toward the french side when arthur of richemont brother of the duke became constable bedford's task was no easy one the english power rested on little but the support of burgundy and the discords in france even in the districts nominally under their control resistance was constant the regent worked his hardest to maintain his brother's conquest he married anne sister of philip of burgundy he strove for peace reform and good government ruling through french officials and according to old customs at verneuil seventeenth of august fourteen twenty four against odds almost as great as at agincourt he won a complete victory over a combined army of scotch and french but there were forces at work against which even so able a man as bedford could not contend philip of burgundy was at best a very doubtful ally and with incredible selfishness humphrey of gloucester the younger brother of henry v exasperated him by a marriage with jacqueline of Aino, a cousin of the duke after getting the anti-pope to divorce her from the duke of brabant to whom philip himself had married her more than this he laid claim to her territories on which her kinsmen had designs on his own account bedford smoothed things down for the time jacqueline acknowledged philip as her heir in holland Aino, and zealand and his attention became absorbed in strengthening his dominions in the direction of the netherlands but relations with his old allies were not made more cordial by this event english rule however was doomed whether burgundian support was retained or no the very fact of the long war with england and the sense of a common danger was beginning to develop in france a spirit of nationality which sooner or later was bound to sweep the foreigner out of her land 
the train was laid but a match was needed to kindle the fire and the credit for this must be given to the heroic maid of orleans who despite her apparent failure and cruel death infused fresh life and vigour into the party of resistance and aroused a spirit of enthusiasm throughout the country of incalculable value the fortunes of france seemed at the lowest ebb when joan of arc appeared on the scene charles under the influence of evil counsellors was sunk in apathy and despair the english were besieging orleans which had lost hope of succour and the fall of which would have delivered touraine berry and poitou strongholds of the french party into the hands of the english never was help more urgently needed and it came in the person of a young girl inexperienced and uneducated but inspired by love of her country and belief in her mission joan of arc was born of peasant parents in domremy a village on the borders of lorraine she had been taught to sew by her mother and had been occupied either working at home or guarding her father's sheep all her life she had little learning but a vivid religious faith when only twelve years of age she had heard voices which she believed to be those of st catherine and st margaret bidding her leave her home and go forth to the help of the king of france to whom she should restore the kingdom and this order was repeated again and again despite the entreaties of her parents whom she dearly loved joan felt that she must obey the divine message she went forth to vaucouleurs and begged the captain of the town to send her to charles my lord captain know that god has told me many times to go to the gentle dauphin who should be and is the true king of france and that he must give me men at arms with whom i shall raise the siege of orleans and lead him to be crowned at reims after much persuasion the captain gave her a small escort and dressed as a man she set out for chinon on the river andre where charles was then dwelling here having gained admission she went straight to the king although he was in no way distinguished from the many nobles who surrounded him and proffered her request it was long before she could win favour eventually she was taken to poitiers and questioned by learned doctors to whom she answered modestly but with a shrewd sense of humour and more than held her own at last charles let her go with a small force to join the french already confronting the besiegers and she won the hearts of all by her confidence and piety the english before orleans had erected towers or bastilles from which they assaulted the town and these the rescuers had to storm joan first dictated a letter to the english commander demanding surrender if you will not do right the maid will act so that the french shall perform the finest deed that has ever been done in christendom there were days of hard fighting before the besiegers were driven off joan led the attacks and all marvelled that she seemed to understand the art of war like a veteran commander at the final assault though wounded she bore her banner to the ramparts and when it touched them she cried all is yours enter in they entered and the town was relieved eighth of may fourteen twenty nine the english retreated discouraged and alarmed orleans welcomed her deliverer as a saint and all france resounded with praise and joy joan could not rest with her mission half fulfilled charles still hesitating was almost forced by her to reims the way having been cleared by another victory at pate eighteenth of june fourteen twenty nine before this battle joan asked the duke of alencon who came to know if they should fight have you your spurs what said he are we to retire or to fly no indeed she replied they will fly and you will need your spurs to pursue them and it happened as she foretold in the cathedral at reims seventeenth of july fourteen twenty nine where all previous kings had been crowned charles was anointed with the holy oil joan standing by standard in hand when all was over she humbly embraced the king's knees shedding tears of joy gentle king now the will of god has been done for he wished that you should come to reims to be crowned to show that you are the true king to whom the kingdom ought to belong even now 
joan's advice was not always followed and sorely against her wishes the siege of paris was abandoned although such was the panic amongst the enemy that a bold move had every hope of success weary of delay the maid on her own account led a small force to compiegne which was being attacked by the english ally the duke of burgundy here her courage carried her too far and in fourteen thirty she fell into the hands of john of luxembourg who sold her to the english who were overjoyed at the chance of destroying the witch charles the seventh stirred not a finger to save her never can his memory be cleared from the shame of such a desertion she was taken to rouen where a long trial began conducted by the bishop of Bourvet, a partisan of england and burgundy and every ingenuity was exercised to convict her of heresy and witchcraft through long days of questioning joan stood firm she would neither deny the divine nature of her message nor let fall a word which might involve her king in blame her answers not only show her saintliness and courage but display a fund of common sense and shrewdness which were peculiarly characteristic of her not till the very last did she waver then worn out by a sermon of denunciations terrified by the thought of the faggot and the stake urged by a friend to save her life she set her mark to a document which was a denial of her saints and of the sacredness of her mission in return her life was spared and she was condemned to imprisonment for life her weakness was but momentary once more encouraged by the heavenly voices she repudiated her denial and went to her death as a relapsed heretic twenty eighth of may fourteen thirty one in the market-place of rouen on a platform high above the crowd joan of arc was burnt to death my voices were of god they have not deceived me she cried as the flames rose round her scarcely an eye was dry amongst the spectators even her judges wept we are lost we have killed a saint cried king henry's secretary in tardy horror at the deed it was true that the english cause was lost they themselves were losing energy and self-confidence while the french were gaining it but the dreary struggle dragged on yet for many years bedford brought the young king to france and his coronation at paris in fourteen thirty one was intended as a counterblast to the ceremony at reims but the affair was a dismal failure no impression was made on the french none but english took part in the service which was performed according to english rites above all it was accompanied by none of those gracious acts which usually graced the coronation of a new monarch little money was distributed amongst the people and no prisoners were released meanwhile the duke of burgundy the one weak prop of english power was becoming more and more alienated possibly the career of the maid of orleans had had some effect even on duke philip assuredly he felt that it was better to be on the winning side whilst little by little the ties which bound him to england were loosening his sister the duchess of bedford had died and for once her wise husband had committed an imprudence in forming a new marriage with the young jacquetta of luxembourg a vassal of burgundy even the emperor sigismund had been won over to charles the seventh and had denounced the ambitions of duke philip whilst his subjects parisians burgundians and flemings were all longing for peace just at the last one more stumbling block was removed by the death of john of bedford an incalculable loss for the english and with the treaty of arras in fourteen thirty five the long hostility between france and burgundy was ended for the time the duke being bought off by very substantial bribes he was granted the counties of masson and auxerre the towns on the somme which gave him a strong footing in picardy and he was to be free for life from all feudal subjection to charles the seventh even the king was awakening to some sort of energy thanks it is said to his love for the beautiful agnes sorel who stimulated his dormant ambition and cried shame on his slackness 
Paris was retaken by the constable Richemont, who had lately gone over to the side of the French, and Charles, on his solemn entry into the capital, was received with heartfelt enthusiasm. England was at this time weakened by those quarrels and divisions which were fast leading to the Wars of the Roses, and accordingly the Duke of Suffolk in 1444 arranged a truce which was ratified by the marriage of Henry to the famous Margaret of Anjou, a union which was fraught with disturbing consequences to his kingdom. The truce brought anything but peace to France, which, as after Bretigny was wasted by bands of professional soldiers, écorcheurs, as they were now called, because they skinned their victims to the very shirt, but at least it gave Charles time to reconstruct his army, to restore financial order, and to get control over the government. Thus, when hostilities were renewed, he was better able to face them. Bit by bit, lands were recovered from the English. Normandy was retaken, and by 1453, all Guienne but Bordeaux had succumbed. A last effort was made to save the port, which itself was loyal to the English rule, and Talbot, a veteran warrior, eighty years of age, but still full of energy, was sent to its relief. At Castillon, however, he lost his own life, and his troops were defeated. Bordeaux fell, and of all she had possessed since the twelfth century, of all the conquests of Edward the Third and Henry V, nothing remained to England but the town of Calais. The Hundred Years' War was over at last, 1453. The long struggle had left traces in France which could not at once be effaced. The country was wasted, depopulated, apparently ruined, but no race has more recuperative power than the French, and the energy and industry of the people rendered recovery extraordinarily rapid. Above all, France had become a nation, and a nation which was to take a position of the greatest prominence in the centuries to follow. Politically, everything tended to establish the absolutism of the crown. The French asked for nothing but peace and order, and gave up the liberties they had won earlier without a murmur. The nobles endeavoured feebly to resist, but the praguerie, as their attempt was called, came to nothing. They had been tried and found wanting, and love of country came more and more to be bound up with loyalty to the king. Much of this revival of the French monarchy was due to the counsellors of Charles the Seventh, Charles the Well-Served, as he has been truly called, and these counsellors were chiefly members of the bourgeois class. Of these the best known is Jacques Coeur, a rich merchant of Bourges, where his house is still shown adorned with the device a veillant to painted hearts rien impossible he became the king's treasurer and did much to improve the finances and to reform the currency among other changes the taille formerly levied by all lords in their own estates was made into a royal tax only to be paid to the king for this and for his great wealth he incurred much hatred amongst the upper classes and a case was got up against him on the pretense that he had poisoned Agnes Sorel. Although this absurd accusation fell through, others were invented, the king did not defend him, and he was banished after being deprived of all his possessions. Another burgess, Jean Bourreau, did so much work for the French artillery that for more than a century it was considered superior to that of any other country. The reign of Charles the Seventh left France an independent country with a standing army and an orderly government. But he passed his last years in suspicion and misery, disliked by the nobles, deserted by the Dauphin, the future Louis the Eleventh, and endangered by the ambitions of the Duke of Burgundy. It is even said that he starved himself to death for fear of poison. It is hard to feel any pity for a man who had shown such shameful apathy, such base ingratitude, and whose successes were wholly due to the exertion and devotion of others. End of section 20
section twenty one of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eleven the shores of the baltic part one the baltic sea was to the north of europe what the mediterranean was to the south all the chief trade of the north was conducted along its shores ships plied constantly from the baltic to the north sea and thus to western europe the fishing industry especially in the days when the strict rules of the church rendered fish an indispensable commodity was a great source of wealth and it was here that herrings could be caught in the greatest numbers the coast of scania as the southern portion of the swedish peninsula was called was the favourite haunt of the herring in the fourteenth and early fifteenth centuries important towns sprang up on the shores of the baltic and the north sea and the question who should exercise control over these valuable waters and to whom should fall the lion's share of the profits of trade and fishing became a burning one this political question arising chiefly out of commercial rivalries on the west was complicated on the southern and eastern shores by religious considerations the baltic sea and its neighbouring waters were surrounded by three different races the scandinavians inhabited denmark sweden and norway the germans mecklenburg and part of pomerania the closely connected coast of the north sea and brandenburg which was not far from the ocean while the south and east part of pomerania prussia lithuania livonia and estonia was the home of the slavs the same race which inhabited poland and bohemia long before our period begins the poles and the bohemians had been converted to christianity and so had the vens as the western slavs in pomerania were called a country which had been practically germanized from the valley of the vistula eastwards the slavonic people of the coast were heathen and uncivilized efforts had been made from time to time to win over the prussians and their neighbours to the christian faith but the work of conversion was dangerous as well as difficult and early in the thirteenth century a polish duke invited a body of german knights to aid in the task the conquest of prussia and the settlement of the southeastern provinces of the baltic were therefore begun by germans instead of christianized slavs the teutonic knights thus introduced into the north were a military order founded originally at the time of frederick barbarossa's crusade to the holy land after the great emperor's death a few fragments of the german army struggled on to take part in the siege of acre where some pious merchants of bremen and lubeck formed a body of soldier nurses to look after the sick of their own race and the german knights of st mary as they were called grew into an important order with rules very similar to those of the templars from whom however they were distinguished by the black cross which they bore on their long white mantles while their national character was secured by the admission of none but germans to full membership of the order when palestine ceased to present opportunities for military energy the teutonic knights had made their headquarters at venice and from thence they gladly came to fight against the heathens of northern europe they built their fortresses of torn culm and marienwerda along the valley of the vistula and joined hands with a small military order called the knights of the sword which had already been established at riga to force christianity on the heathen livonians more to the north conversion in the eyes of the teutonic knights meant conquest the sword was their chief method of dealing with the heathen little by little prussia fell under their rule and poland saw to her disgust a strong german military state established along the shores of the baltic where she would have preferred to extend her own christianity under slavonic rule in the early fourteenth century when the fate of the templars showed what might be in store for any military order which could give no sufficient reason for its continued existence the whole teutonic body concentrated itself in prussia and the grand master made marienburg his permanent headquarters from thence they conquered land to the west of the vistula 
with the important towns of Elbing and Danzig, and the emperor, glad of the extension of German influence in these important regions, confirmed their rights and took them under his special protection. The fourteenth century marks the highest point in the fortunes of the Teutonic Knights. They had great territorial power, and though Poland was a jealous rival, they were able to hold their own in wars against her. They still had the reputation of being unconquerable, and the honor of fighting for Christianity against the heathen Lithuanians, who were blocking their progress on the east. In this famous military order of the north, together with cold calculation of political motives, there still lingered something of the old chivalry which had inspired the early knights. Plans of valuable territorial conquest were still combined with crusading ardor and religious zeal. All youths who wished for distinction in arms were anxious to obtain some of their training amongst these white-robed warriors of the north. Here we find Henry of Derby fighting before he seized the English throne as Henry the Fourth. Here the gallant John of Bohemia lost his eyesight in the midst of Lithuanian marshes. Toward the close of this century, however, there were signs of coming danger. The chief towns in the dominion of the knights, such as Danzig, Elbing, Torn, and Königsberg, were members of the Hanseatic League, of which we have still to speak united that is with other german cities in a way which tended to make them very independent of their immediate rulers then the union of kalmar which placed sweden norway and denmark all under the same ruler was a menace to the influence of the order in the baltic but worse than all was the accession of jogello of lithuania to the throne of poland and his acceptance of the christian faith it will be remembered that the death of Louis the Great of Hungary and Poland had left his dominions to be divided between two daughters, and that Hedwig the youngest was invited to rule in Poland on condition that she gave her hand to the Lithuanian duke, and this Jogello was baptized and crowned under the name of Ladislas in 1386. The union of Poland and Lithuania meant a very strong and hostile power which threatened the dominions of the Teutonic Knights, and the baptism of Jogello, followed as it was by the forced conversion of all his heathen subjects, removed the formal pretext for the continued advance of the northern crusaders. In 1410, a severe defeat at Tannenberg showed at last that a Slavonic army could defeat a German one, and destroyed the belief in the impossibility of conquering the Teutonic Knights. Fifty-one German banners, hung in the church of Krakow, remained to keep alive the pride of the victors. For a time the heroism of Henry of Plauen, the Grand Master, who held out at Marienburg, despite apparently overwhelming odds, saved the order from total destruction, but its power was badly shaken, and German territory on the southern Baltic was falling back once more into the hands of the Slavs shortly after our period ends poland obtained the lands which the knights had conquered to the west of the vistula and they were only allowed to retain their territory in eastern prussia as a polish fief while the germans were thus competing with slavs on the eastern baltic on the west it was a question whether they or the scandinavians should control trade in that quarter and especially in those narrow sea passages leading around denmark to the north sea German traders and fishermen were early tempted to the shores of the Baltic as well as to the North Sea, and German towns began to spring up on other lands than their own. Thus Visby, on the island of Gotland, the centre of the northern trade, and the great seat of the fishing industry, although under Swedish rule, was to all intents and purposes a German town. Lübeck, Strausund, and Rostock were called Vendish towns but were peopled and developed by German merchants, and there were commercial settlements of Germans in Norway, in England, and in Flanders, at Bergen, London, and Bruges. In early days, no trade could be carried on safely except by associations, and men were accustomed to group themselves together for all sorts of purposes. Thus, within the towns themselves, 
merchants would combine in hanses or merchant guilds which obtained control of all the trade of that town and often became the chief managers of its municipal government while on foreign soil these traders would form themselves into societies for mutual protection and mutual benefit bands of fellow countrymen in a strange land merchants in those days went themselves to look after the sale of their goods and were often obliged to spend long periods in other countries where they might be at a considerable disadvantage compared with the native inhabitants it was this which rendered the foreign hansas so very necessary they used to combine themselves to acquire what were called factories places where they could live and also store their goods over these societies officials would be placed responsible for order and justice and general meetings would be held for common business and for making trade regulations in england the first hansa was formed in london by merchants from cologne and gradually other towns were allowed to enter and enjoy the same privileges at first hamburg and lubeck established hansas of their own at lynn on the east coast but at the close of the thirteenth century these three factories combined together and formed one very important german guild in london the hansa alemanniae combined of these traders both from the baltic and the north seas similar establishments flourished in bruges bremen novgorod and other places End of section twenty one section twenty two of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eleven the shores of the baltic part two a close connection was always maintained between these foreign settlements and the home towns for merchants did not stay permanently abroad but were constantly going and coming and eventually the hansas in foreign lands and the large towns with their guilds or hansas at home formed themselves into a league for trading purposes which has become famous in history as the hanseatic league and which developed into a great political as well as trading power this league did not appear suddenly at a single moment it was formed bit by bit as one town after another was induced to ally with the rest until at last all the chief cities of north germany and the trading settlements of germans on baltic shores and in more distant lands were members of this vast association and acquired the name of hanse towns the origin of this union probably came from the alliance of lubeck and hamburg the leading town on the baltic and the leading town on the north sea a glance at the map will show how important was the position occupied by these two the best way for goods to pass from one sea to the other was either round the danish peninsula by water through the narrow passage of the sound or if the danes hindered this passage by land from lubeck to hamburg thus it was very necessary for these places to be in touch with one another and they joined for mutual protection of the roads between the two lubeck had already made herself a great power in the baltic where other towns had agreed to adopt her code of trading laws and meetings for common purposes were held from time to time within her walls with the formation of the one hansa in london a further impulse was given to the union of german traders on both seas and the league grew rapidly in size and importance the fourteenth century being the period when it was most numerous most powerful and most definitely organized cologne lubeck and visby each formed the centre of a group of towns of which some of the chief were bremen on the weser hamburg on the elbe wiesmar rostock stralsund and greifswald on the western shore of the baltic elbing danzig torn and Königsberg in the neighbourhood of the vistula and riga on the dwina together with the important foreign depots already mentioned in london bergen bruges and novgorod in its struggle for commercial supremacy the chief danger which the hanseatic league had to face was the rivalry of denmark 
and this became particularly acute after Valdemar Atadag ascended the throne in 1340. Through all the early portion of this period, the three Scandinavian kingdoms of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark were under separate monarchs. The crown in each was elective, though the choice was generally made from amongst the nearest heirs of the reigning family, and there was a good deal of power in the hands of the people in all three states. Denmark, on the whole, had been the most advanced of the three, and above all she had great geographical importance, commanding as she did the waterway from the Baltic to the North Sea, especially when Scania, the southern portion of the Swedish peninsula, was in her hands. Before the reign of Valdemar, however, Denmark had been going through a period of decline. The nobles had rebelled and deprived the crown of almost all its power, and Magnus of Sweden had gained the province of Scania, and with his son Hakon on the throne of Norway threatened to become the leading power in the north. All this had been very profitable to the Hanse towns, who had bought valuable fishing rights from the Danish king, and who were combining for the defence of trade routes on their own account. With the accession of Valdemar, however, 1340 to 1375, things were changed. He was a man of great vigour, great unscrupulousness, and iron determination. The name Atterdog was given to him because he was so fond of saying, I morgen er dat Atterdog, the day will return tomorrow, meaning that if he could not accomplish his purpose one day, it should be done the next, and his people complained that during his reign no one had time to eat, sleep, or rest. At first the towns did not realize the danger which threatened them from Valdemar's energetic conquest of Danish dominions, not even when he won back Scania from Sweden. But in 1361 they had a rude awakening. King Valdemar of Denmark collected a great army and said unto them that he would lead them whither there was gold and silver enough and where the pigs eat out of silver troughs, and he led them to Gotland and made many knights in that land and struck down many people because the peasants were unarmed and unused to warfare. It was the rich town of Visby which had excited his envy. He is said to have gone in disguise to the place and won the love of a goldsmith's daughter, who revealed to him all the defences of the city and all the treasure stores. Whether he gained his knowledge by such means or no, he certainly sacked and plundered the town and sailed away laden with booty, 1361. Little good did he get, however, from his spoils, since they were all sunk in mid-ocean in a storm which nearly cost him his own life. This high-handed action raised up an unexpected enemy, for not only did Sweden and Norway take up arms, but the Hanse towns combined in their first alliance for warlike purposes and raised a fleet to fall upon the treacherous Dane. Wittenborg, the burgomaster of Lübeck, commanded the ships of the League, and when after some brilliant successes he sustained a serious defeat, his town flung him into a prison from which he was only brought for public execution, his head was cut off in the marketplace of Lübeck, for failure was sternly punished in those days. The first Danish war was ended by a peace which granted freedom of commerce through the Sound, and fishing rights to the Hanseatic League, but Valdemar did not keep his promises, and the towns once more combined in defense of their privileges. In 1367 a large meeting was held in the town hall or Hansa room of Cologne, and seventy-seven towns proclaimed, because of the wrongs and injuries done by the king of Denmark to the common German merchant, the cities will be his enemies and help one another faithfully. Valdemar despised his enemies and answered by a letter in rhyme little calculated to soothe their feelings. One verse runs, If seventy-seven ganders come cackling, come cackling at me, if seventy-seven hansers come crowing, come crowing at me, do you think I care two stivers? Not I, I care not two stivers. The war which followed resulted in the complete triumph of the League and the Treaty of Strausund, which ended it, marks the high-water mark of Hanseatic power, and established the towns as a real political force in the north, 
1370. Not only were trading rights granted, but all the strongholds of Scania were put into the hands of the League, which could thus command the passage of the Sound and control the fisheries. Finally, no king was in future to ascend the Danish throne, except with the consent of the towns, whose privileges he was to confirm. Meanwhile, Valdemar had been more successful in his relations with Sweden. Her king Magnus was a very feeble character, and Valdemar married his daughter Margaret to Hoakun of Norway, the son of Magnus, thus opening a way to great future possibilities. In 1375, on the death of Valdemar, the Danes, with the consent of the Hanseatic League, chose Olaf, a little boy of five years old, son of his daughter Margaret, as their king. And in 1380, the death of Hoakun put him on the throne of Norway also, whilst his mother was real ruler of both kingdoms. Margaret was a woman of great character and ability, and so successful was her rule as regent that when her young son died in 1387, Denmark and Norway both chose her as their sovereign, 1387 to 1412. Sweden was not long in following their example. Magnus had made himself so unpopular that in 1363 the Swedish nobles had revolted and offered the crown to his nephew, Albert of Mecklenburg, who had imprisoned his rival and put himself in his place. The new ruler was not in the end more satisfactory than the old, and a party of his discontented subjects now turned for help to Margaret of Denmark and Norway. Nothing was better suited to the wishes of the ambitious queen. She sent an army which completely defeated the German troops of King Albert, and imprisoning her rival, Margaret undertook the rule of the Swedish kingdom and was as successful there as in her other dominions. 1389 to 1412. In 1397, an agreement known as the Union of Kalmar was drawn up by the councils of the three Scandinavian kingdoms, by which it was decreed that they should always be united under the same ruler, although each state should keep its own laws and constitutions unchanged. Margaret had adopted Eric of Pomerania, her nephew, as heir in her three dominions, and it was also laid down that successors should always be elected from amongst his descendants. This Scandinavian union might have been a considerable danger to the Hanseatic League, but as a matter of fact it was not very durable. Margaret ruled ably and firmly, but Eric was but a feeble successor. Denmark and Norway remained united until the 19th century, but the Swedes began very soon to rebel against the connection and chose rulers of their own, even before our period is over, although the permanent severance was not effected until later. The Hanse towns, however, had other dangers to face, and were past the height of their power by the 15th century. Their decline was due rather to dissensions within than to enemies without. Rivalry began between the towns on the North Sea and the towns on the Baltic, and despite the strong position gained by the latter in their struggle with Denmark, they were no longer able to maintain their supremacy. This was not entirely their own fault, but partly that of the herring. For some mysterious reason, the shoals of these fish, which had so long frequented the Baltic, and particularly the coast of Scania, removed themselves almost entirely to the shores of Holland, and thus helped to found the importance of the towns of the Low Countries. Amsterdam, it has been said, was built upon herrings. What was begun by the herring was completed by geographical discoveries, and when new trade routes were opened through the larger oceans, the Baltic ceased to occupy the position of importance which had been hers in the Middle Ages. End of section 22. Section 23 of The End of the Middle Age, 1273 to 1453 by Eleanor Constance Lodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12. The Spanish Peninsula, Part 1. The period 1273 to 1453 
is not one of particular interest in the history of the spanish peninsula it follows an important time of progress in the early thirteenth century when the moors were driven back farther and farther until the small kingdom of granada alone remained to them whilst the christian states were growing in power with this extension of territory it is not until after fourteen fifty three that the marriage of ferdinand and isabella formed a united kingdom of spain by the junction of castile and aragon and that the moors were finally driven from their last stronghold in the peninsula the history of spain therefore during this period is merely an account of the separate states of which the country was composed and of their relations with one another and with foreign powers it is impossible to treat it as a whole the spanish peninsula in the latter half of the thirteenth century was divided into portugal the christian kingdoms of castile aragon and navarre and the moorish province of granada which was little by little being reduced in size by the encroachments of the christians castile was a very large and important kingdom including galicia the asturias murcia and a great part of andalusia and leon which had been united in twelve thirty by agreement for the public good aragon and catalonia had been joined by marriage alliance in the twelfth century an event of great importance for the former as she gained in barcelona by far the best seaport in spain inhabited by the most industrious and most enterprising population of the peninsula navarre was a small mountain kingdom including part of what is now french territory on the north of the pyrenees and its history connects it on the whole rather more closely with france than with spain the previous history of spain had been one long continuous crusade against the power of the moslem with the result that her nobles were all warriors pure and simple they had never become manorial lords such as were found in other feudal countries rulers of agricultural estates in which they were supreme over their vassals and heads of justice throughout their land constant war at home had also prevented them from seeking occupation in the east and thus deprived the country of that wider outlook and the impulse toward commerce art and learning which had been spread through europe by the great crusading movement thus spain had advanced on her own lines she was never really feudal as was most of the continent her aristocracy was military but not territorial free towns with independent populations sprang up sooner than in any other country and the kingdoms of aragon and castile early enjoyed the benefits of a representative government which developed from the old popular councils of the visigoths the government of castile was a limited monarchy the sovereign being hereditary from the eleventh century although always receiving formal recognition from the cortes or national parliament this cortes differed much in composition at different times but it contained as a rule nobles clergy and representatives from the towns and it exercised control over taxation the necessity for its consent being fully recognized over legislation also it had influence sanction was required for any royal enactments and the king had to swear to obey what it decreed it seems to have been consulted on any matter of importance and it was the honourable if somewhat formal duty of the cortes to acknowledge the succession of the heir apparent besides this assembly there was a smaller council to aid the king in executive business this was a body for the most part composed of hereditary nobles though sometimes additional members were received chosen by the cortes from amongst its own members justice was in the hands of town judges or alcaldes but the kings in the thirteenth century added officials of their own called corregidores and there was appeal from either of these bodies first to the governor of the provinces then to a tribunal of royal alcaldes in many ways this constitution much resembled that of england only that there was no trial by jury and no county representation such as was supplied by our knights of the shire aragon had even a more liberal constitution than that of castile although at the same time it was more aristocratic 
here the cortes consisted of four estates prelates barons or vicos hombres as they were called men of the state not rich men knights or infanzones and the deputies of the towns an important office in this state was that of justicia a minister responsible for the observance of the laws and the supervision of justice which was very well administered this good management of justice was especially secured by two rights peculiar to the government of aragon by a process known as juris firma causes could be called up from any court in the realm to the supreme court of the justicia another process known as manifestacion was something like our writ of habeas corpus by it a man could be saved from any illegal violence could be taken from the hands of royal officers and his trial could be hastened in twelve eighty three a document known as the general privilege which has been called the magna carta of aragon contained a whole series of important provisions for the safeguard of order justice and good government arbitrary taxation secret tribunals and private sentences were forbidden the use of torture was prohibited and the control of the cortes over the whole administration was affirmed and strengthened one great feature of aragon was the very close union between nobles and people and the enthusiasm for liberty which both displayed the aristocracy formed a real check on the arbitrary power of the king and according to a spanish writer fought at all times not for power but for popular liberty in twelve seventy three castile was in the hands of alfonso x or the wise a rival of richard of cornwall for the imperial dignity though he never possessed more than the empty title it was his sister eleanor who is so well known as the devoted and dearly beloved wife of our king edward i alfonso was a really learned man if not a successful king castile at this period was making great progress in civilization and learning st ferdinand the previous king had done much for his country and brought her much needed peace while from this time moors in castile became as scarce as foxes in middlesex amongst the people of the day none was more advanced or better educated than the king himself he was a very many-sided genius and his studies comprised both science and letters a mathematician and an astronomer he was also a poet a musician and a linguist perhaps above all a legislator in astronomy he corrected some of the errors in the old calculations and helped to explain the movements of the stars ballads he wrote of some merit and chronicles also but the chief work of his life was the siete partidas seven divisions a very comprehensive code of law compiled from the roman and visigothic rules from the old local customs or fueros and from the decrees of various great councils this celebrated work was not adopted immediately as the law of the land but was gradually introduced in the next century and has remained ever since one of the most interesting examples of a great national legal code so much for the wisdom of alfonso of his reign there is little to record his subjects and his own son rebelled against him and his death which placed sancho on the throne in twelve eighty four left castile a prey to civil war disorder and lack of government only one event of interest took place in this reign in the conquest of tarifa from the moors this was the work of a famous commander known as guzman the good after the city had been taken by the christians it was again besieged by the moors assisted by prince john a man of even worse character than his brother sancho during the operations the young son of guzman fell into the hands of the besiegers and john leading him before the walls of the town threatened to kill him on the spot if his father did not surrender the noble guzman refused and with proud defiance flung down his own knife at the foot of the cruel prince who slew the boy but failed to capture the town and he and the moors were forced to retire ferdinand the fourth twelve ninety five to thirteen twelve successor of sancho was no better than his father some success marked the early years of his reign while he was still a minor 
and at this time was formed a confederacy of burgesses known as the hermandad or brotherhood which was an attempt to control the monarch curb the nobles and introduce some order into the administration this ferdinand has been surnamed the summon on account of a tradition that his brother whom he had unjustly condemned to death summoned him to appear before the tribunal of god and that within thirty days he died suddenly and without apparent cause alfonso the eleventh thirteen twelve to thirteen fifty whose reign did not do much to improve the morals or remedy the disorders of the kingdom is at least distinguished for a great victory over the moors at the battle of salado thirteen forty and his death from plague came at a moment when he was winning more military successes his son pedro the cruel thirteen fifty to sixty nine is the only one of this series of kings who has left a really well-known name behind him and his fame is one not to be envied since it is based almost wholly on his perfectly superhuman wickedness and cruelty perhaps some crimes have been laid unjustly to his charge but this does not absolve him from enough to blacken any reputation he was married to three wives at the same time blanche of bourbon he deserted directly after the ceremony and eventually murdered jews were constantly massacred in cold blood before his eyes his half-brother don fadrique was murdered probably by his own hand whilst staying at his own palace and under his own royal safe conduct it is useless to continue the enumeration of his odious deeds which would fill many pages the history of the revolt against him led by his half-brother henry of trastamare aided by french support and the companies under Guesclin have been told in the chapter on french history the black prince unfortunately for his reputation was induced by pedro to support him replaced him on the throne by the battle of navaretta or najara and went home to die pedro meanwhile was soon involved in fresh war and finally lost his life thirteen sixty nine in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with henry himself to whose tent he had come on a mission of treachery he had hoped to find du guesclin alone and to succeed in winning him over by bribery but found instead his brother and his executioner the death of the cruel tyrant was welcomed with rejoicing by the whole country and henry of trastamare was willingly recognized as king thirteen sixty nine to seventy nine this title was disputed however by john of gaunt the son of our edward the third who had married constance of castile a daughter of pedro but his attempts were unsuccessful although war continued after henry's death against his successor john the first thirteen seventy nine to ninety the english were assisted by the portuguese whose king ferdinand had fought for his own claims against henry of trastamare and whose son john of portugal was now married to a daughter of john of gaunt john of gaunt and his wife took the title of king and queen of castile but in the end their claims were handed over to their daughter catherine and her marriage to the spanish prince henry ended the quarrel end of section twenty three section twenty four of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twelve the spanish peninsula part two henry succeeded his father when only eleven years old henry the third thirteen ninety to fourteen o six despite his youth the reign was one of the most peaceful and prosperous castile had enjoyed for a long time unfortunately his early death brought a renewal of troubles under his little son john who was only two years old on his accession the reign of john the second fourteen o six to fourteen fifty four was most prosperous so long as his uncle ferdinand was regent after he came of age in fourteen nineteen it was simply a record of the work of alvaro de luna constable of spain the most celebrated warrior of the time 
who held the weak-minded king in such subjection that he is said to have not even ventured to go to bed without his permission alvaro though short and bald excelled all spaniards in dancing horsemanship and minstrelsy he had more solid qualities also as a soldier and leader of men his power became unbounded and his magnificence unequalled he was not only constable and grand master of the military order of santiago but lord of at least seventy towns and castles and by far the richest man in spain the favourite however was more famous for military glory and lordly splendour than for statesmanlike qualities and when in fourteen fifty three his execution was forced upon the king by revolt amongst the nobles encouraged by his own wife and son he left the kingdom in a weak and disorderly condition john himself died the year after and is only worthy of remembrance as the father of that isabella of castile whose marriage with ferdinand of aragon established in fourteen seventy nine a united kingdom of spain a kingdom which was raised under their joint rule to a position of real importance in europe aragon when our period begins was still under the rule of her famous king james the conqueror twelve thirteen to twelve seventy six who had freed his country from the moors a man of great personal strength courage and energy he added to his prowess on the field some knowledge of letters and wrote his own chronicles in the catalan dialect one of the chief authorities for the reign that we possess his domestic government was chiefly occupied in putting down resistance with a heavy hand and his private life was marred by violence and licentiousness yet he was a strong capable ruler and a man who commands admiration by his vigour and force of character just before his death he resigned the crown to his son pedro and joined the cistercian order to end his days as a monk in prayer and penitence for his sins his son pedro the third twelve seventy six to twelve eighty five inherited a good deal of his father's ability and won for himself the title of the great since the moors were conquered in his territory the energy of the new king turned toward foreign parts when the young conradin son of the emperor frederick the second fighting for the sicilian crown had been seized and executed by charles of anjou the glove which he flung down as a gauge of defiance and vengeance was brought to the court of aragon for pedro had married a daughter of king manfred constance the rightful queen of sicily the suspicions of charles and his ally the pope were aroused by the warlike preparations the king of aragon was making nominally in view of an approaching crusade when questioned on the matter the king kept his own counsel if i thought my right hand knew my secret he said i would cut it off lest it should betray it to my left but when the sicilian vespers excited the people of the island to rise in a body against their french rulers a spanish fleet was conveniently near at hand to take their part after the victories of roger de loria a famous aragonese admiral which have already been noticed pedro was proclaimed king of sicily in twelve eighty two in a truly mediaeval spirit charles of anjou summoned his rival to bordeaux to settle their disputes in knightly combat the challenge was accepted and a rather curious episode followed pedro did appear at bordeaux on the day named but secretly and before the time for he suspected a trap very probably with truth in any case he rode round the lists to save his honour and then disguised as a merchant escaped back to his native country leaving his disappointed rival to proclaim him a coward and a traitor and to turn to other schemes for his destruction pedro had many a trouble through his acceptance of the sicilian crown excommunicated by the pope and attacked by philip the third of france he died immediately after his adversary from wounds and a fever contracted in the war after the death of pedro a series of kings followed whose reigns have left but little permanent trace on the history of aragon one of them james the second conquered sardinia from the genoese whilst his brother frederick successfully established his claims to the kingdom of sicily 
for the most part each sovereign spent a troublous career fighting with his own turbulent nobles who were ambitious of extending their influence over the whole conduct of government at the close of the fourteenth century there was a period of disputed succession the troubles of which were encouraged by pope boniface the ninth who was at enmity with the spanish kingdoms on account of their support of his rival benedict the thirteenth himself a spaniard king martin thirteen ninety five to fourteen ten who was recognized by most of the people is important as uniting the kingdom of sicily to that of aragon he had much trouble with this new possession and also from revolts in sardinia stirred up against him by papal intrigue on his death fresh succession disputes broke out six rival candidates entering into competition for the vacant throne at so critical a time the strength of the constitution was strikingly displayed government was continued by the justicia and the parliament as the cortes was called the situation however was becoming dangerous and civil war threatened until a council was assembled containing representatives from the three great provinces of which the kingdom was composed valencia catalonia and aragon for the purpose of considering the different claims after an orderly and careful deliberation the council held a solemn meeting begun by service in the church and announced their decision to the assembled crowd the elected monarch was ferdinand of castile fourteen twelve to fourteen sixteen a nephew of the late king martin and a man who had already given proof of the greatest wisdom and moderation as regent of castile during the minority of the feeble john the second during his short reign he worked for his country with a zeal and unselfishness which did much to solve some of the worst difficulties of the time and won for himself the title of the honest or the just troubles in sicily and sardinia were quieted and marriages were made which connected aragon with castile and navarre when ferdinand's early death placed his son alfonso v fourteen sixteen to fourteen fifty eight on the throne there was little trouble to fear in his spanish dominions alfonso therefore turned his attention to italy where he inherited sicily and sardinia and had hopes of succession in naples too his connection with this country arose from the action of queen joanna who had no heirs of her own and offered to adopt him as her son and to confer on him the right of succeeding her on the throne this offer gladly accepted was later recalled by the changeable queen who adopted instead louis the third of anjou with the result that a bitter struggle ensued between the two when joanna died in fourteen thirty five alfonso claimed the vacant throne which was now disputed by rene of provence known to us as the father of margaret of anjou a younger brother of louis who had died just before his adopted mother eventually the king of aragon was successful and ruled for the rest of his life as alfonso the magnanimous king of aragon and the two sicilies his name is better known in the history of italy than in that of spain the history of navarre during this period is scarcely worth following in detail but it may be well to remember that philip the fair united the little kingdom to france by his marriage with queen joan in twelve seventy four that in thirteen twenty eight when philip the sixth succeeded in france navarre was once more ruled as a separate kingdom under another joan mother of the well-known charles the bad and that connection with aragon was established by the marriage of queen blanche of navarre to john brother of alfonso v and ultimately his successor the troubles which resulted however in the war between john and his son charles extend beyond the limits of our period and it was not until much later still that the little kingdom lost its separate existence the southern part being seized by ferdinand of castile while the northern was in the sixteenth century united to france by the succession of henry the fourth of navarre the turbulent history of these christian kingdoms during the present period may be wanting in interest and unity but it introduces us to some of the actors in the european drama it is specially connected with the history of sicily where the dynasty of aragon made good its claim 
with france owing to quarrels with the house of anjou and with the french help given to henry of trastamar and with england whose loss of gascony in the fourteenth century largely resulted from the disastrous alliance between pedro and the black prince and with whom war was caused by the claims of john of gaunt to the castilian succession every century was also bringing a step nearer the ultimate union of spain and her period of greatness when she was to take up a position of the utmost importance both in europe and in the new world the neighbouring kingdom of portugal had been struggling into a nation partly by reason of its long wars with the moors partly by its resistance to castile which was never strong enough to absorb it in the fifteenth century the portuguese led the way in the new development of maritime enterprise and discovery this was largely due to prince henry the navigator son of john i of portugal and grandson of our own john of gaunt he was determined to find a new route to india round the continent of africa and fitted out repeated expeditions which explored the african coast and made many important discoveries amongst others of the islands of madeira the canaries and the azores the cape of good hope was not rounded during the lifetime of the enterprising prince but it was a portuguese seaman who first succeeded in the attempt toward the close of the century and opened out the new route to india the great epoch of discovery with all its far-reaching results lies beyond our present period but before fourteen fifty three portugal was already pointing out a new road to fame and wealth End of section twenty four. Section twenty five of the End of the Middle Age, twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by Eleanor Constance Lodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter thirteen The Greek Empire and the Ottoman Turks, part one in the year twelve sixty one baldwin the last of those latin emperors who had established themselves in constantinople at the time of the fourth crusade was expelled and the greek empire was revived in the hands of the family of paleologus a family which was to occupy the throne of the east until constantinople fell before the turks the empire though restored never regained its old strength it was shorn of territory and surrounded by enemies while the interlude of latin rule had thrown the whole administrative machinery hopelessly out of gear the hostility between the greek or orthodox church as it was also called and that of rome was rendered more bitter than ever the differences in actual belief were not great the latin church had added certain words to the nicene creed which the greek had never adopted and over which fierce controversy raged the doctrine of purgatory also was rather differently regarded and there were certain ceremonial disputes but the really inseparable barrier was the reluctance of the eastern emperor and patriarch to recognize the supremacy of the pope and now since the conquest of constantinople by the latins there was an additional feeling that union was equivalent to bondage and shameful subjection at various times during our period attempts were made to heal the breach but without any permanent result the emperor might promise one thing but the greeks would refuse absolutely to carry out the agreement the most notable instances of this have already been mentioned in previous chapters the arrangement with gregory the tenth at the council of lyon and the definite terms of union drawn up and signed at florence between eugenius and the greek emperor john the sixth even this remained a dead letter owing to the hostility of the whole people and this constant antagonism prevented western europe from making any organized effort to aid their fellow christians in the east against the inroads of the unbelievers other difficulties hastened the decline of the eastern empire her once widespread dominions were getting more and more overrun by hostile neighbours and war on the borders was almost incessant 
for some time also the descendants of the latin emperor tried to reassert their claims and danger threatened from powerful european princes such as charles i of anjou and charles of valois who were connected by marriage with the exiled house to meet these pressing dangers the emperors called in a force to their aid which was to end by proving a more fertile source of troubles than the distant foes after the sicilian war was over a number of mercenary soldiers spaniards of all sorts under a soldier of fortune called roger de flor were only too glad to seek occupation in the pay of the greeks and were known as the catalan grand company such were the outrages and cruelties practised by these wild troops on the emperor's subjects that friendships soon turned to enmity and open war broke out between greeks and spaniards which only ended when in thirteen fifteen the grand company withdrew to fresh fields of bloodshed it was during this catalan war that the worst foe of the greeks for the first time gained an entry into europe amidst all the dangers which threatened the eastern empire far the most formidable was the advance of the turks a steady flood of invasion was pouring over from central asia and it was chiefly to aid in checking these oncoming hordes that roger de flor was invited to the east when however spanish arms were turned against their allies the company did not hesitate to look for aid to the moslem a band of turks crossed the dardanelles in thirteen o six to attack the empire and never from this date was europe entirely free from the presence of the turk it was from the early thirteenth century that these inroads from central asia began in real earnest and from that time onward the turks had been driving out or destroying the christian population of asia minor the turk has been called a nomad and a destroyer and settlement meant slaughter or extermination of all previous inhabitants the barbarians came in overwhelming numbers they required plenty of room for they were a pastoral not an agricultural people above all they were mohammedans and those who would live with them must adopt their faith and become followers of the prophet the christians who could not resist therefore fled to save their faith as well as their lives or were forced to become tributary subjects it was a branch of these tribes known as ottoman turks which was threatening europe in the east in his youth othman first ottoman sultan 1299 to 1307 dreamt a dream he had been suing in vain for the hand of the beautiful malkatum and in his dream he saw rise from the body of this lady first the crescent moon and then a magnificent tree which grew to an immense size and spread its branches over seas and mountains the caucasus atlas and many others whilst from its roots flowed stately rivers the nile the euphrates the tigris on which vessels of all sorts sailed out to foreign lands then of a sudden he saw the leaves of this tree changed to the form of shining sword blades turning toward the towns below them and above all toward the great city of constantinople which lying between two seas shone like a diamond between two emeralds and formed the central ornament of a gigantic ring encircling the earth on the morrow he told his dream and won the hand of his lady-love and from this union sprang the dynasty which was to rule over the great ottoman empire and was to press forward little by little to the brilliant diamond of the vision othman has been called the founder of the dynasty his son orkhan thirteen twenty six to fifty seven the founder of the turkish nation the latter captured nicaea and other important places so that his state was firmly established in the heart of asia minor his rule is chiefly memorable however for the introduction of the terrible child tribute and for the origin of the famous force of janissaries which helped to render the turkish army so invincible christians who wished to purchase security in the exercise of their own worship might do so by paying tribute which orkin changed into a contribution of children a christian village was forced to supply every year a certain number of young children 
who were brought up as Mohammedans, trained with great care, and employed when they grew up either in the army or in the civil administration. In the army the services of these janissaries or new troops were of the utmost value. From the very first the boys were educated for this and for nothing else. They were subjected to the most severe discipline, taught to do with little food and sleep, exercised in riding and the use of arms, and above all trained to the most absolute and unquestioning obedience only in actual war was any of the strictness of their life relaxed and thus fighting was looked upon as their holiday time and the ideal of existence brought up in this way with never a thought outside of their regiment and with certain privileges not shared by the rest of the army these janissaries were inspired by an esprit de corps which made them a perfectly unrivalled force in the hands of the sultan thus was the victory of the crescent secured by the children of the cross the greek emperors had little with which to resist this formidable adversary and they looked in vain for real help from the west meanwhile constantinople itself was a prey to constant internal troubles the government was weak a mixture of despotism and oligarchy the ruler was in theory absolute but his power was hampered by the factious opposition of the nobles who having no real position in the administration were hostile and irresponsible his subjects were composed of all sorts of nationalities between whom little real unity existed and this was particularly obvious in the army the emperor ruled over four principal races in the balkan peninsula albanians slavs greeks and Valachs to which were added Catalans left behind by the Grand Company and a large number of Venetians and Genoese who were engaged in trade rivalries in the Levant and the Black Sea. Venice held certain states in the Morea, besides Corfu, Crete, and other islands which she had gained in the Fourth Crusade, whilst Genoa established herself in Asof and the Crimea, and held Pera or Galata, a suburb of Constantinople north of the Golden Horn the history of the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries is one long continuous record of greek decline and turkish progress in thirteen ninety six the christians of the west made an attempt to come to the aid of the east a crusading force was collected under sigismund then king of hungary later elected emperor he was accompanied by john of burgundy then only count of Nevers who gained in his expedition his surname of the fearless the turks at this time were under a leader of great celebrity bajazet idurim or the thunderbolt so called from the speed of his movements and the christians made the fatal mistake of underestimating their enemy on the danube at nicopolis the two armies met and the defeat of the crusaders was complete and decisive thirteen ninety six the french knights brave to rashness but totally undisciplined rejected the more prudent counsel of the hungarians and breaking through the front ranks which faced them charged blindly after the flying foe only to find that the flight was feigned and to be brought to a stand by the archers when in too great disorder to resist at the same moment the chosen troop of janissaries burst forth from the ambush which concealed them and routed the remainder of the army with tremendous slaughter sigismund escaped by boat and only reached constantinople in safety with great difficulty john of burgundy was captured and held to ransom three hundred prisoners who refused to renounce their faith were massacred in cold blood badges had seemed invincible he swore to press on westward until he could feed his horse on the altar of st peter in the heart of rome itself constantinople was besieged and christendom trembled until a sudden diversion was created by a new horde of barbarians and the attackers became the attacked whilst bajazet had been winning victories over the christians timur or tamerlane the tartar heading a vast host of tribes from eastern asia had been ravaging persia and turkestan and conquered aleppo from the sultan of egypt and was now threatening the territories of bajazet himself 
in fourteen o two he sent a curt message to the ottoman sultan demanding an instant surrender of all that he had conquered from the greeks bajazet sent back a reply couched in the most insulting language possible and then hastened in person to meet his haughty rival leaving constantinople rejoicing in temporary safety at angora twenty eighth of july fourteen o two a battle was fought which lasted through a whole long burning july day but at last bajazet was captured and his army defeated timour dragged his illustrious prisoner with him from place to place until in the following year death freed him from disgrace and after two more years of victory and bloodshed his tartar conqueror followed him to the grave End of section twenty five Section twenty six of the End of the Middle Age, twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by Eleanor Constance Lodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter thirteen The Greek Empire and the Ottoman Turks. Part two. Europe was saved for the time, and it was nearly half a century before danger from the Turks again became really acute it was their renewed attacks which led john the sixth to undertake his unpopular journey to italy in search of union and support his hope of a combined effort by europe on his behalf was as we have already seen disappointed but christianity produced two other champions whose efforts shed some glory on the declining cause of the eastern empire john hunyadi governor of transylvania called the white knight of wallachia headed hungarian resistance against the turks and won over them a series of victories on the danube after the council of florence a christian army recruited from various nations put itself under the command of hunyadi who was also accompanied by ladislas the king of poland and hungary and by cesarini the cardinal who had done much good work at the council of baal this force marched through bulgaria and captured varna where they were attacked by the turks and prepared to give battle here again the christians failed from over haste and from contempt of the enemy hunyadi who knew well the turks and their tactics had strictly enjoined ladislas to maintain his position and not to be induced to advance on an attack his advice was in vain for during his absence the king brave but too impulsive was urged by some of his followers to break his command lest the fame of the battle should belong to the white knight alone hunyadi returning from a successful attack on his own side hastened to the rescue of ladislas who was in the thick of the fight and struggling with the famous janissaries themselves the mistake was irremediable the king himself paid for it with his life the christians were forced to retire and cardinal cesarini was also slain either in the battle or the retreat another opponent of the turks was an albanian prince george castriot known to history as skanderbeg a contraction of iskandarbe or the lord alexander a title given to him by the turks when a boy he had been delivered as a hostage to the sultan who brought him up as a moslem and treated him with the greatest favour and distinction apparently the youth retained in secret the christian faith and planned to escape on the earliest opportunity his method of doing so was marked by unscrupulousness as well as boldness whilst actually occupying a post of authority in the turkish army he seized the occasion of confusion after a defeat to force the commander at the point of the scimitar to sign a document handing over to him the command of a turkish fortress on the frontier of albania armed with this he deceived the turkish governor took possession and admitted a force of albanians in the night who murdered the garrison then throwing off the mask he put himself openly at the head of revolt in his native country the rest of his life was spent in rescuing albania and harassing the turks but his strength was not sufficient to divert the sultan from his one great object the establishment of mussulman rule in christian constantinople 
the final siege of the greek capital was begun by the sultan mohammed the second in the spring of fourteen fifty three constantine son of john the sixth was the last christian emperor of the east his possessions by this time had been reduced to constantinople itself with a strip of land about one hundred miles in length behind it and about half the peninsula of the morea the people over whom he ruled were demoralized by a long period of losses and disaster and for his defence he was largely dependent on ships and men from genoa and venice which were placed under the command of the famous genoese soldier john justiniani both sides were busy all through the winter of fourteen fifty two in making their preparations the city of constantinople formed a rough triangle its base to landward and its two sides bounded by the golden horn on the north and the sea of marmora on the south on the other side of the golden horn lay the genoese settlement of pera or galata walls completely surrounded the town while across the mouth of the golden horn a boom guarded the harbour against the entrance of hostile ships on the landward side the chief seat of danger the walls were triple the inner wall forty feet in height had higher towers at regular distances below that at an interval of about fifty feet lay the second wall similar but smaller and in front of all a sort of breastwork guarded in its turn by a wide ditch several gates led from without into the city besides which there were smaller military gates leading into the different enclosures between the walls to allow soldiers to pass into them the defenders were too few in number to guard all these three outworks so it was decided to meet the enemy at the second wall as the inner wall which should have been the most defensible was not in perfect repair in the post of greatest danger near this wall was stationed the choicest troops under justiniani himself and the emperor constantine while the admiral with his fleet stayed near the boom across the harbour the emperor's forces have been estimated at about eight thousand mahomet had at least one hundred and fifty thousand with which to invest the city and he had collected all the turkish vessels from the surrounding seas sailing ships and longboats rowed by forty or fifty oarsmen which he hoped to find even more useful than his land forces all along the landward wall the mass of the turkish troops were stationed before them they constructed a ditch and palisade that they might be protected whilst firing on the besieged a further force was situated behind galata on the north of the golden horn the chief feature of mohammed's army was undoubtedly the cannon which were to prove the insufficiency of medieval walls to meet new-fashioned methods of attack these huge guns however were still of a very unwieldy nature they were not on wheels but had to be embedded in the ground and fired always in the same direction they threw huge stone balls which did enormous damage but as a rule could not be fired more than seven times a day one monster cannon took sixty oxen to drag it and two hundred men to march beside to keep it in place whilst labourers had to go on before to prepare the roads for its passing and to strengthen the bridges from a military point of view the siege of constantinople marks an interesting transition between the old and new methods for weapons of every kind were employed both ancient and modern not only gunpowder and cannon but longbows wooden shields lances and catapults the first attempts made by the turks to assault the city and force the boom were failures on the sea indeed their opponents won a signal success which helped to raise their spirits four genoese vessels bringing provisions to the city were set upon by the mass of the turkish fleet just outside the golden horn where both armies could watch the combat the sultan from the other side of the walls of galata the christian ships had guarded against all dangers and from their superior height were able to fling stones and missiles on the lower-built turkish vessels 
in vain the sultan rode to the sea until his long robe swept the water calling forth impotent curses and useless advice to his admiral suddenly after a dead calm a favourable wind arose which carried the victorious italian vessels safely under the protecting walls of the town in the night they were towed over the boom whilst the christians made as much noise as possible with trumpets to pretend they were in huge force so that the turkish fleet might expect an attack and remain on the defensive mohammed answered by a true tour de force if he could not cross the boom he would reach the golden horn in some other way behind the walls of galata he constructed a tramway of rollers and greased logs stretching right across the little peninsula from the bosphorus to the harbour a distance of about a mile and over this in a single night eighty ships were hauled by ropes and pulleys and oxen strange indeed must have been the spectacle all the vessels were fitted out as though on sea sails were unfurled the rowers kept time with their oars and shouting and music accompanied this long voyage on dry land and cheered up the spirits of the men the christians were horrified by the unexpected appearance of turkish ships in their harbour and were forced to place stronger garrisons than before to guard the seaward wall nevertheless the defence was stout and renewed assaults on walls and boom were again a failure even attempts to undermine the city were rendered difficult by the rocky nature of the ground again mahomet planned an unpleasant surprise for the christians in a single night a huge wooden tower was constructed so tall as to overlook the outer walls and to render it possible to fling scaling ladders across on to it whilst under its protection the besiegers could work at filling up the ditch in preparation for a general attack the emperor's forces worked hard on their side all night they toiled at repairing the damages done by this machine on their defences and succeeded at last in blowing up the turret itself by barrels of gunpowder placed in the ditch another astonishing piece of work which the sultan carried through in an incredibly short space of time was the construction of a bridge across the upper portion of the golden horn to join the two divisions of his forces this was made with over a thousand wine barrels fastened together by ropes and covered with beams and planks so that five soldiers could walk abreast on it pontoons also could be attached to it bearing cannon which could be used thus with a greater effect against the harbour wall for seven weeks the struggle had been continuing and within the city party and race dissensions were adding enormously to the difficulties of the defence the greeks themselves were divided between those who looked for help to the west and those who hated any idea of the union italians were disliked by the greeks who considered them as rivals in trade and the italians themselves were split up into venetians and genoese bitter enemies of long standing one man however commanded universal admiration and was obeyed by all parties alike justiniani more than justified the trust that had been placed in him and worked ably and incessantly against the constant assaults of the foe when the walls were battered down he constructed a stockade of sticks and stones and earth or anything that could be got together covered with skins to protect it from fire but courage and resource were alike unavailing against the overwhelming numbers of the enemy and europe did not raise a finger to help the final struggle of the eastern empire toward the end of may the sultan determined to attack the city on all sides at once and thus to reap the full advantage of his superior numbers through the camp went the news of his promise to the soldiers three days unhindered plunder to every man in the army an inducement to valour fully appreciated by his troops within the city all felt the crisis was approaching and the emperor urged his followers to one more heroic effort do not lose heart he said but comfort yourself with bright hopes because though few in number you are skilled in warfare strong brave and noble and proved in valour on the twenty eighth of may 
the last christian service was held in the great church of saint sophia which was crowded with all who could be spared from the defences the emperor and his followers partook of the sacrament and the solemn ceremony over all went to their posts on may the twenty ninth shortly after midnight the general assault began the defences were still strong and the defenders were determined again and again the besiegers hurled themselves against the stockade again and again they were beaten off it seemed as though the city might still be saved when two disastrous accidents decided the fate of the day one small gate leading to the outer enclosure had been forgotten it was found unguarded by the enemy and a body of turks appeared unexpectedly amongst the defending garrison and pressing into the city itself hoisted the turkish flag on some of the turrets worse than this however was the withdrawal of justiniani wounded mortally as it proved later he left his post and made his way to his own ship near the harbour on which he died three days later his disappearance was the signal for total demoralization and despair in vain constantine endeavoured to rally the men and continue the defence of the stockade the janissaries forced their way through and the emperor plunging into the thick of the fight died in one last gallant attempt to keep back the inrush of the foe by sunrise all resistance was ended and the city was given over to the terrible three days of plunder which mahomet had promised after these the sultan himself made solemn entry into the city and in saint sophia now a mohammedan mosque the faith of the prophet was now proclaimed the fall of constantinople marks the close of our period and an epoch in the world's history the eastern empire disappeared and turkey was established as a european state europe was aghast at the event she had done so little to prevent but indirectly she was to reap good results from the immediate evil it is not true that the fall of constantinople introduced the study of greek in the west scholars especially in italy were already reading and teaching the language and literature of greece but after fourteen fifty three the number of fugitives increased greatly and amongst these fugitives came scholars who quickly rose to distinction in the west the study of greek became both more systematic and more widespread and helped the development of freedom of thought and the breach with old superstitions and old teaching on the turks themselves the result of this conquest was to make them less nomadic and more agricultural once established in europe they extended their conquests westward and became a power whose influence was to be important throughout the whole later history of the continent end of section twenty six recording by pamela nagami in encino california november two thousand and seventeen end of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge